The 2017 NFL Draft. How did your team make out? Is LeVar Ball going too far? ESPN laid off 100 people. Stephen A. still has a job, and some people are not happy. The Brooklyn Nets get called out. And who is on the bench this week? All that and more on What's the 411 Sports, coming right up. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this week's edition of What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, it's good to see you. Good to be back. Spring is in the air, so is the pollen, and my eyes are, woo they're on fire. So I hope any of you allergy sufferers are getting some relief. But enough about my woes. Mike, what's up? Well, first story that we're going to get to, Keisha, is the 2017 NFL Draft. I want to ask you, Keisha, what are your top two storylines from this year's draft? Well, I think the biggest story was the quarterback grab that happened. We had the Chicago Bears trade away four picks to move up one spot to grab quarterback Mitchell Trubisky. And, you know, he, Trubisky was number 12 on a lot of people's mock drafts. And so it was quite shocking that not only did he go number two, but the Bears traded away picks to move up one spot. And so they had just given uh, Mike, Mike Glennon a nice sum of money to be what we thought was the starting quarterback for this coming season, and presumably he will be because it seems as though Trubisky is going to be a little bit of a project and needs some time to get ready. But um, And also, the Browns did not choose a quarterback. We didn't know at the time what the Browns were going to do because they do have a need at quarterback, but they chose Miles Garrett with the number one overall pick. And I would say my 2A... Uh, is the no actually my number two my number two is the fact that Cleveland did not choose the quarterback and I think that is something that lets them lets us know that they weren't going to make that plunge unless they were really in love with the quarterback it, that were available in the draft and they weren't so instead of going for the one you love you love the one you're with and who's who knows there's still quarterbacks on that market like a jay cutler or colin Kaepernick who need a home so maybe that will happen and so then my 2a the draft is always filled with these feel-good stories and the one feel-good story that i liked was uh to Karis mckinley he was drafted by the atlanta falcons and when he went up to get his hat and jersey he had a picture of his late grandmother and his grandmother was very influential in his life and uh, he told her before she died that he was going to make it to the NFL, and he did. And he brought the, the picture up with him, and he gave an emotional interview afterwards where he cursed, and he was like, well, find me later. So I, that was my takeaways from the draft. Yeah, well, I agree with you. I think what's only time will tell as far as what's going to happen with this draft. It's going to take a couple of years in order to really be able to judge all 32 teams to see how these players wind up. But from my impression, I think this is going to be known as the Mitchell Trubisky, Trubisky draft. Whether he turns into the next Peyton Manning or whether he turns into the next Ryan Leaf, people are going to be speculating about this situation on what the Chicago Bears did for many years to come, I think, just trading for one spot. A lot of people saying that if the Bears didn't actually do that, they could have still grabbed this young kid. So it'll be interesting to see how he shapes up as the quarterback for the Chicago Bears. And the other thing is, just briefly on the New York Giants, our team, I thought they had a really good draft. I like what they did in the beginning, getting the tight end out of Old Miss. And then on top of that, they got themselves Davis Webb, who is a young quarterback out of Cal that's going to be Eli Manning's backup, along with Geno Smith the next couple of years. So a lot of teams had good drafts here, but I was happy with our Giants. I thought that John Lynch, the, the general manager and his rookie rookie gig with the uh, San Francisco 49ers did a fantastic job. The NFL draft, it gets so blown out of proportion sometimes with all the media speculation and all these grown men that look like college professors that are grading <laughs> these kids on their you know, drug tests and all that. Yeah. But I think sometimes we take some things too seriously. But for this draft, I thought it went over pretty well. We're down one draft and we've got one more to go. And it's off to a rocky start for future uh, NBA prospect, top five projected uh, NBA prospect, Lonzo Ball. He is getting no love from the big three of the shoe companies. Adidas, Under Armour, and Nike have not offered a shoe deal to Lonzo Ball. His father, the Ball Ball, is undeterred as he's going to explore alternative avenues to get a shoe deal for his son. So do you think that Lonzo Ball is paying for his father's actions, and do you, do you think that maybe LeVar Ball is, on, is onto something here? 
I think two things. I think he is paying for his father's actions, no question about that. But also, let's face it, Lonzo Ball had a very, very lackluster NCAA tournament. He did not look that good against Kentucky in that game early in the NCAA tournament. So I think as far as his father's concerned, you know, I think the biggest problem with, with LeVar Ball right now is that he keeps being given this platform to voice these, these idiotic moronic opinions. The big story now that's come out on Twitter today and all the social media platforms is that they want they want to charge two hundred dollars for his sneaker or something like that. And that's just inexcusable. This kid's never played an NBA game. I think Lonzo Ball is the real deal. I think that despite the fact that he didn't look so good towards the end of the season for UCLA, this kid is a five tool player. He can play defense. He passes well, shoots well from the perimeter, drives to the hole, and he's a team guy. It doesn't seem like that a lot of times with his father. And I think to answer your question, Keisha, absolutely the father is hurting this kid. He's living vicariously through this kid to the worst degree. Yeah. I wouldn't be so quick to dismiss what LeVar's goal is. He, you can tell that he has an entrepreneurial spirit. He has his own big baller brand. I think that it's what it's called. And he's been pushing that. And I think what he wants is an extension of that. He wants to put his son and I think in essence, the, the remaining two sons in positions of power where they are not just pawns to make Nike, Under Armour, and Adidas wealthy. So I like that idea, but he doesn't know the art of finessing. I'm sure that if he knew how to be more cagey and be willing to compromise a little bit, that maybe, yeah, he won't get that co-branding that he wants right away, but maybe, little bit down the road he could put that in a deal where he can get that co-branding that he wants and have Lonzo be you know not just another player re repping somebody's shoe but LeVar is just not I don't think he's there yet because I, I think his ego makes him believe that he's the smartest person in the room and maybe he may be able to pull off another shoe deal going a, a non-traditional route so I wouldn't dismiss what his goal is so far but I think he's definitely hurting his son because now he has even more pressure as if he didn't have any already with saying that he's better than Steph Curry with the father saying that Lonzo was better than Steph Curry and all these other things is now that he has to even perform even more so to maybe even get another look at uh, getting a shoe deal from one of these companies because they were interested in, in him before he even Played one minute on the NBA court, so we'll see. I'm I'm pulling for Alonzo. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're gonna go into the playoffs, and the playoffs round one is completed, and Russell Wes why not Russell Wilson, Russell Westbrook. <laughs> we'll go back to basketball here, uh, <laughs> and his OKC Thunder were out of the first round by the hands of the Houston Rockets, and. The Los Angeles Clippers were set pack in by the Utah Jazz. Now, even though the Thunder exited the first round, Russell Westbrook went publicly and stated that he wanted to stay in OKC. So, Mike, I ask you, should Westbrook want to stay in OKC? And then part two is, with the Clippers' early round exit and the lack of overall playoff advancement over the course of Doc Rivers' tenure, do you think Steve Ballmer is going to get rid of Doc or do some big shakeups with the Clippers? First off, first off with OKC, uh, the New Yorker in me, and I want to be careful about this, has me thinking, if I'm in Russell Westbrook's shoes, why in the world would I want to play the rest of my career in Oklahoma City in such a small market? However, I think he's comfortable there. I think he likes it. I think he's open to all possibilities. I think the OKC Thunder would like to try to give him an extension before this next season starts up. I don't think he'd be willing to do that. I think he wants to wait for his mega payday come once next season finally does end. As far as OKC is concerned, it's going to take them some time to be a contender. They don't have that much cap space for this offseason to go out and get any all-stars or any big-name free agents. So I think for right now, they're going to have to write the ship and really rely on, I hate to say it, but the, and Russell Westbrook would call me out if you heard me saying this, but it's a one-man show. It really is. They're a good team, but for now, really, they're going to have to just depend on the fact that they're going to wind up being a fifth and sixth seed that's not really going to go that deep into the playoffs because the West is too packed. As far as the Clippers are concerned, if I'm Steve Ballmer, you know, I think you want to hold on to these things that you have. Look, they haven't made a deep playoff run, the Clippers, when the Chris Paul era, the Blake Griffin era. But when you have a unit that's so cohesive like that with Doc Rivers at that home, keep that going. Keep those guys. Try to get them all back and give this another shot and try to get them some proper pieces that you can try to contend for a title with. 
Uh, as far as Westbrook is concerned, I think he should pump the brakes of saying how much he would like to stay at OKC until he has a clear idea of where management is going to take this team. Because this it was this season, if nothing else, showed that Russell Westbrook needs help. He could do it on his own, but can only get them but so far. If the ultimate goal is to get a championship and really compete in the Western Conference, he needs help. And if if I were him, if they don't, if I don't see a clear path to that. I'm not looking to stay. They're not going to be a shortage of teams who would want somebody like Russell Westbrook. And going to L.A. with the Clippers, I think there there is a need to shake things up a little bit. Maybe you keep your core three in Blake Griffin, Chris Paul, and DeAndre Jordan. But I think that you fire Doc Rivers as the GM. I think that as a GM, he's fallen short. He has not surrounded the... The, the, his big three, and if you want to put J.J. Redick in the equation, his four with enough talent to be able to compete. And I, I'm always of the opinion that when you're a GM, you need to build your team to beat the best in your conference, and which is the Golden State Warriors. And we've seen the moves that they've made. They got Kevin Durant, and Kevin Durant's not walking just, you know, you can't just get Kevin Durant off the street. He's a one in a lifetime, but you can see they wanted to get better and Doc Rivers has not gotten his team to even almost be in the same gym as the Warriors and that's Doc the GM. So I think if you get rid of Doc the GM and let him focus truly on being the coach, you might get some different results. So I think that in that regards, there should be some shake up there. Yeah. Well, stick with us because we've got so much more to get into. Coming up, we're, call- we're talking basketball, baseball, and some more football as well. The average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Well, it was doomsday in Bristol as ESPN laid off 100 of its employees. The firings did not include, however, Stephen A. Smith or Jamel Hill, which has led to some grumblings by some people in the social media outlets. It got pretty ugly on social media. Keisha, why would some people think that ESPN would fire Stephen A. Smith or Jamel Hill? Well, um, let me just say that I wish the the people who were laid off from ESPN well in their future endeavors. I'm sure they'll land on their feet. They're really, really talented. And layoffs are unfortunately an ugly part of business sometimes. Now, why some people would want to have Stephen A. off the air or Jamel Hill. Now, we'll start with Stephen A. Because he gets on people's nerves, all right? I think with Stephen A. Smith, you either love him or you hate him. I happen to be in the, the love him part. I, he gets on my nerves sometimes, but I think he, he's a little extra when he doesn't need to be. But overall, I, I enjoy what he what he says. He's a person that speaks his mind. He's unapologetic about it. And, you know, there was an article where uh, an, a writer, I believe Jeff Perlman, aimed his ire at Stephen A. And his Stephen A responded and was like, why are you, basically, why are you coming at me? I've worked hard. I've been a journalist for over 20 years. i worked hard to get where I am. Why are you saying that I should be fired? And to his credit, Stephen A has broken a lot of stories, especially in the NBA. That's his bread and butter. And there, there were times when I remember seeing him on air and he talking about LeBron going back to Cleveland. And it seemed far-fetched and probably nobody thought about it because why would you leave Miami for Cleveland? I mean, South Beach, you're there, the ladies in the bikinis, the nice weather, you're there with your homeboy, D-Wade, you go on banana boats and all that good stuff. Why in the world would you ever go to Cleveland? I know that's his home, but you can always go visit. But sure enough, a couple months later, it was announced that uh, LeBron was going back home to Cleveland. So... Um, that's probably why some people wanted him gone. Jamel Hill, I'm not sure, uh, because she is someone who is also, I find, really knowledgeable, and she is a ratings draw. She had a show with Michael Smith um, called His and Hers, and that was in the afternoons, and then they took Jamel and Michael Smith, who's African-American, and moved them to the new and improved sports center. So I don't know if it's just jealousy, hatred, just... You don't want, you just have personal bias. You just don't like these particular people. But, I mean, just fall back. I, and 
I will just end with this. And, you know, I found it fun, um, ironic. What jumped out to me was that these two are African-American, one male, one female, and why they were targeted out of all the people. And I don't want to make it a racial thing, but maybe be, because I am an African-American woman, that kind of jumped out at me. But there also have been some other polarizing figures on ESPN, like Skip Bayless, who's now on Fox Sport. And there were plenty of people who couldn't stand his... You know, I was about to say another word. <laughs> they couldn't stand him either, so I'm sure they're, they're glad to see him gone. But I don't know. People just need to get over it and not wish on other people's downfalls. You know, Mike, I'm thinking about getting a new car. What about you? I'm thinking about getting one myself. Yeah, I can't wait to feel that nice soft leather and get that new car smell that I enjoy so much. And speaking of new car smell, Nikolai Jackson, a member of our social media team, had his fair share of smells and different types of automobiles when he attended the New York International Auto Show. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience? Well, I had a great time at the New York Auto Show. Um, I got a chance to talk to all the new automakers and... I talked to Volvo, I talked to Jeep, I talked to Volkswagen, but in particular I talked to James Bell, the director of Kia, and uh, we, he really talked about the key to Kia's success. Let's look at the video. What has been the key to Kia's success? The key to Kia's success, I like, uh, I like the way that sounds, has been number one, if you go back seven, eight, nine years ago, Kia came out with a 100,000 mile, 100, mile warranty, powertrain warranty, to kind of put people's mind at ease. And they focused on uh, fuel efficiency, really kind of pumping up uh, not only the power inside the vehicle, but then also its responsible use of fuel. I know fuel prices are low right now, but hey, saving 20 bucks at the pump every week is a good thing. Then I think what we're really seeing today that's taken to the next level is design. Started off with the, the Soul and the Optima to have a vehicle that really stands out from a design perspective. Um, looks like it uh, should cost you much more and allows you to really stand out in, a, in many segments that Kia plays in versus vehicles from Honda, Toyota, Subaru, nothing that's really engaging. So Kia's really done that. And I think the last part of the puzzle has been our quality. Uh, winning the JD Power IQS award last year, uh, it was a huge step. Beat Porsche, Lexus, Mercedes. Uh, you know, all of a sudden Kia is at the top of the rank. So those four things, I think, you know, uh, uh, reliability, design, fuel efficiency, all these uh, just attractiveness. It's all led to this day. Kia's key demographic. Uh, from the data I see, it's just about a little bit of everybody. I mean, that's why we're excited about a vehicle like this, the Stinger, which is going to obviously uh, appeal to a whole different uh, demographic of folks. But yeah, we really see ourselves as a cross uh, kind of cross section of the culture. Everybody who's looking for uh, wanting to maybe uh, not buy another used car, you know, the budget's a little tighter, but we love a vehicle with that new car smell and uh, that 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 uh, warranty, which is obviously uh, a nice peace of mind. So you got people in those, and then others that are saying, you know what, I'm tired of my BMW breaking down on me. I'm tired of the cost and expense of running this vehicle just because it's got this badge that somehow makes me feel better about myself. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people come into the Kia brand just looking for something smart but different, which that's how they see themselves. Nice, I had no idea that Kia was stacking up so well against the likes of Lexus, Porsche, and Mercedes in a JD Power Award category. Yeah, neither did, neither did I, Mike. I, I, it really came as a shock to me, it really did. Well, Nikolai, it seems like you had a great time there. Thanks so much. And keep it right here, folks, because coming up is our New York Sports Report. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Never. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Well, Keisha, while the Yankees have soared in the American League East, the Mets have hit the bottom of the National League East. Keisha, I ask you, are you surprised by the Yankees' success so far? And also, what's it going to take for the New York Mets to get back into the hunt in the NL East? Uh, I'm not sure if I was surprised by the Yankees and what they've done so far. I just wasn't sure. So maybe I'm pleasantly surprised. I like it. I like when the Yankees do well. It does, it's good for the city. There's a little energy. Because I think there's quite, I don't know the ratio between Mets fans and Yankees fans here in New York City. But I feel as though when the, the Yankees are not doing well, the energy is a little lower. So maybe there's more Yankees fans than Mets fans. Or maybe the Yankees fans are more vocal. I don't know. But great, great. I, I like to see that they're doing well. I hope it continues. It's still early in the season, but I, I'm encouraged. Now for the Mets, whew, wow. So 
the key for them to turn around the season is to get healthy. Tough, tough weekend the Mets had last weekend against the Washington Nationals. Only the Mets could win two out of three <laughs> against Washington and still have a horrible weekend. The Syndicard injury really has blown up in the front office front office's face. It does not look good. I agree with you. I think the Mets can turn around. The problem with the Mets, though, is, as you pointed out, they need to get healthy. On top of that, the Washington Nationals have gotten off to a very good start, one of the best records in baseball, and the, the farther the Mets climb to the bottom, it's going to be tough for them to get back up. As far as the Yankees are concerned, it's been all about pitching. I get it. Aaron Judge has been terrific. The lineup has been hitting in the clutch when they have to. But pitching, Michael Pineda has been terrific. CeCe Sabathia, despite a bad start last weekend, has really been pretty good for this team. And, of course, Masahiro Tanaka, after a slow start, has really began to turn things around. So for pitching and the Yankees, as long as you get them into the fifth, sixth inning with that bullpen, they're going to be able to compete and go ahead and win a lot of ball games. The, a the AL East is stacked, no doubt about it, with Baltimore and Boston. But I think the Yankees, even though it's early, it's it's early May right now, and the spring hasn't really sprung just yet, <laughs> but I think the Yankees are going to be a contender this year. I'm, I'm sold on that. The Brooklyn Nets were called out by none other than former commission David Stern. Stern was not happy with Brooklyn resting its players in the final game of the season against the Chicago Bulls, helping the Bulls lock up the final playoff spot in the East. Keisha, I ask you, is David Stern wrong for interjecting his opinion about the Nets and its players? Where was Stern's voice when other teams were resting their players all season long? I don't know where he was. Maybe he was on vacation. Maybe he was counting all of his money that he made as NBA commissioner. I don't know where he was when resting was really a hot topic. And the game that he's referencing, the Nets versus Chicago, in essence, it was not a big game. It was a meaningless game for the Nets. They were. It was their last game, of this, um, and they had already finished their last home game. What, what were they playing for? They weren't playing for the playoffs, and so they made a decision that instead of risking injury to one of their players that they're definitely going to need next year, why not sit down? What about, I wanted to know where David Stern was when the, the Cavs, the Warriors, the Spurs sat on nationally televised games, which actually could have put the, the NBA's relationships with their advertising partners in jeopardy because they're putting... All this money, the advertisers are putting all this money into these high marquee games and all the stars have sat out. And one can argue that with the Cavs, they definitely rested over the course of the season and whether the players were on the bench or they were just taking a break from defense, they actually ended the season um, in second place in the East, and which gave them a more favorable playoff matchup when they faced, they faced the Indiana Pacers. So... Stern, do you have anything to say about that? I, I don't know. Just be quiet for right now. We don't want to hear it. <laughs> well, I think this is a case of karma. Look, the Brooklyn Nets have struggled the last couple of seasons. No question about that. How many times, though, have teams who have been all-star contenders, or not all-star contenders, playoff contenders, that have come here into Brooklyn and they've rested their players, and, the, and the, the season ticket holders and the fans who go to these games, they're the ones that wind up getting chipped. Well, you know what? Here the Nets go ahead and they do their thing on the last game of the season where they had absolutely nothing to win, and then you're going to call out the Nets? I didn't like that. And as you said, Keisha, where was Stern throughout the whole season when all these teams were going around resting players, resting players, blah, blah, blah? Miami, yeah, they got hurt here. They were the ones who were in that ninth spot. They wanted to see Brooklyn go fly out their players <laughs> and go compete. It didn't happen. Yeah. And I think the Brooklyn Nets, why why should you go have to play those guys in the 82nd game of the year when you have absolutely nothing to gain from it? My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Nearly every week we put someone on the bench. Keisha, who are you putting on the bench this week? I am placing racist Boston Red Sox fans on the bench. During a game between the Boston Red Sox and the Baltimore Orioles, some Boston fans hurled racial insults towards Baltimore Orioles outfielder Adam Jones, and one fan even went so far as to throw a bag of peanuts at him. That fan was ejected from the ballpark. 
And the Boston Red Sox organization has issued an apology to Jones. And Mike, what do you think of this whole incident? I think the worst part about it is that today in the Boston area, the Boston sports radio and a lot of the fans calling in, they're denying this. They're saying that they don't have any proof. They want the people to be named, the people that were actually issuing these racial epithets to uh, Adam Jones. And it's almost as if the people in Boston, instead of accepting what's actually happened and trying to fix the problem, they're in denial mode. And I think that's really what bothers me. As far as Adam Jones, look, no one should have to go through what he went through. He had a bag of peanuts thrown at him as well. That's the easy part, right? Having a bag of peanuts thrown at your head. I would prefer that than having someone call me so, some, some of the things, even though I'm a white guy, obviously some of the nasty things that they were saying to him, who was an African-American ball player. You know, CC Sabathia made the comment saying that he knows what it's like going into Fenway Park. He says that he hasn't actually been, they, they haven't really necessarily said some of the same things, but it's a hostile environment. And, you know, this is something that's very, very troubling. What, it's 2017 and we're still talk talking about things like this. Yeah, there's a reason why people think that Boston is racist. Here's example one of however many. And what even shocked me was that I was uh, watching ESPN today and there was a writer who was born and raised in Boston and he writes for ESPN and when he heard about this incident, he wasn't surprised. He had he, he was like oh they, like this was normal like this is and the writer was an African American man I should mention that and because he sees this all the time whether it's you know in the sports realm and probably maybe in his own life so Boston Red Sox as an organization really need to take further steps other than issuing an apology it's very nice uh, but they need to go a step further and whether it's finding fans. Re revoking, uh, what do you call those, the, the season ticket hold, holders, or whatever it is, something with more teeth. And I'll, I'll end on this. You know, I think that fans have this really false sense of entitlement because what if Adam Jones took that bag of peanuts and hurled it right in the stands? He would be in trouble. And all that happened was to a fan, he got ejected. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Never. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Well, Mike, we have come to the point in the show where I get very, very sad and emotional because we have to say goodbye to you, our friends. But don't worry, you can keep up with us until we meet again next week by following us on Instagram and Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, All at 401 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike Pisano, we'd like to thank you so much for joining us this week, and we look forward to hanging out with you again next week.